Hibiscus Caribbean Elderly Association is pleased to present the Lucille Tate Lecture 2020. The subject of this year's lecture is the most serious issue faced by the black community since its settlement. Yes or no to taking a vaccine, the impact of the coronavirus COVID-19 on the UK black population. Dr Winston Morgan, Reader in Toxicology and Clinical Biochemistry and Director, Innovation and Impact at the University of East London, presented the lecture. This year, due to the restrictions on contact between people imposed by government to slow the spread of the virus, the lecture was delivered online via the association's Zoom platform to members and guests from Jamaica, Trinidad, Canada and the USA. So it's been seven months since the pandemic started and it doesn't look like it's going away. And the big question is, and the thing that people have been talking about is vaccination. And the question is yes or no to vaccination. And we have to look at this in the context of the impact of the coronavirus, COVID-19, on the UK black population. I'm Dr Winston Morgan. I'm a reader in toxicology and clinical biochemistry at the University of East London. And I'll be taking you on a journey um, looking at these issues and trying to hopefully give you information so that you can make an informed decision. So why ask the question? Surveys suggest that black people are less likely to take any COVID-19 vaccine, although they are most likely to suffer adverse effects or die when infected with the COVID-19 vaccine. So that's quite an ironic situation. You're more likely to suffer, but you are still reluctant to take the vaccine. The question is why? And the factors I'm going to consider in this presentation are going to be why black people, first of all, are more likely to be affected by the virus. I'll spend some time on that because it has, gives some context. We'll have a brief history of medical treatment of black people and how this informs this particular mindset. And what I'll also do if you're going to make an informed decision, I believe you need to have an understanding of how vaccines work. So I'll be taking you through how vaccines work and viruses. Um, not from a not as a scientist well i will be um giving you the information if you like but i'll be breaking it down so that if you're not a scientist you will be able to follow the points i'm making so at the end hopefully you'll be able to make an informed choice about whether you would consider taking a vaccine or not okay so the COVID-19 deaths, the data comes from the Office for National Statistics. This is the government body that collects data about people dying and other things. And what they found is that black males, that's the raw data, are 4.7 times more likely to die when they're infected with the COVID-19 virus. Similarly, black females are 4.3 times more likely to die. Now, this <clears throat> is raw data, so people have argued that um, you really need to take into consideration all the other factors that impact on whether you're likely to die from COVID and then look at the data and see if it makes any difference. And that's what the, the ONS have done. So they've controlled for age because, as we know, more older people are likely to die than younger people. Also, location. So if you live in a big city and more black people tend to live in big cities, you're more likely to encounter the virus. So that could be the reason why. So when you go for things like that, as well as deprivation, if you're living in... Uh, uh, a household with lots of people in it, you're more likely to encounter someone in your family who has been out and, in, and encountered the virus and brought it home. All of these things, comorbidities, that's where you have something like diabetes and um, obesity and heart disease. So all of these things um, are going to have an impact. And with comorbidities, we know that for some comorbidities, there might be high prevalence in, in people uh, from our community. And also occupational exposure. So again, a lot of our people will work in the NHS or perhaps in public facing jobs like transport, etc. So again, you're more likely to be exposed to the, the virus. But when you take all of these things into consideration, clearly the difference comes down, but black males are still more than twice as likely to die and black females about one and a half times more likely to die. And this is quite significant given we've taken in all these controls. So something else must be going on. And that's what I want to explore before exploring why we need to consider if 
um, viruses and what they might do. So, so how should black people or how, how should black people respond to this? Well, we know what's happened in the past over the last um, six months or so. There's been the burden of the pandemic on, on black people. So as a pan, as the pandemic took hold, the narrative, that means the sort of story, the idea in the media meant that black people or people racialized as black began to feel the extra burden of COVID. It was as if it was something to do with them. So this um, diagram I have is from an article I wrote for Men's Health magazine in October, where we, we basically explore some of these ideas. So black people are feeling the pressure of COVID. There's no doubt about that, okay? Why is that? Um, well, there's, there, we're gonna explore that, but also uh, we need to understand how can you die uh, from COVID? And there are three stages. The first stage, I've just noticed a mistake. The, the th first stage is exposure. So are you more likely to be exposed to the virus? Are you likely to develop serious infection from the virus? And then are you likely to end up in hospital from the virus? And then will that lead to death? So that's what I'm gonna explore, these three phases and how that leads to more black people dying from COVID-19. So stage one is you're exposed to the virus and that will lead to being infected and exposure means for it to for you to be in, in, in infected you need to be exposed to what we call a, a certain viral dose that means how much of the virus you are exposed to so that's why things like social distancing and wearing a mask will be important because the more mask and social distancing you have the less you're likely to be exposed so what are the factors which increase infection rates it's going to be location. As I've said, if you live in a big city, you're more likely to be infected because the virus is there and you're in closer contact, the type of job you do, the household you live in, and also the culture. Perhaps there might be cultural practices that means that you're likely to get closer to people that could have an impact. And all of these push um, exposure leading to infection, as we see. But there are factors which decrease infection rates. As I said, like social distancing, washing hands, wearing a mask, and again cultural behavior so you can change your cultural behavior don't go to those places where lots of people are crowded in and that will block if you like or reduce the number of people the number of people who are going to be um, infected following exposure so that's stage one then we move on to stage two infection and again for infection to lead to becoming seriously ill a number of things need to be in place it's going to be about your general health and so if you're and also your age so if you're older than 60 you're more likely to get seriously is ill. Also, if you have a compromised immune system, that means your immune system isn't um, as good as it should be, either through age or illness or perhaps medication that you take. And also comorbidities, and those things I've mentioned earlier, things like heart disease, diabetes, um, um, obesity, those things will push, if you like, infection going to serious illness. But again, these things can be blocked. These things are going to be blocked or won't happen if you're younger than 50, for example, if you're relatively healthy, if you do a lot of physical exercise. And also, and this is quite interesting, if you had a vaccine, a vaccine against the virus, that would also pre prevent it. Or there are, uh, or if you were taking certain antiviral medication, if they develop, if they developed one, and at the moment there isn't a really effective antiviral medication despite all the stories of remdesivir or even an antibody treatment such as the one that Trump got. Um, that could also prevent or, or block infection going to serious sickness. So assuming you're infected and you're seriously ill, it still doesn't mean you're going to die. There's a third phase that's really important, particularly for black people. And that stage is about from serious illness and you're hospitalized. Why do some people die? And again, the factors are going to be important is late diagnosis. So is it that you're not being diagnosed early enough? That can also have an impact. So if you're not diagnosed, you can't be treated. But also, once you're in hospital, is the treatment that you're getting what I term negligent or poor? Are you getting that key, important and attentive treatment that will prevent the virus, sorry, prevent um, your sickness leading to death? Um, that is the big question. So. How can that be prevented? It can be prevented by having timely intervention, rapid 
hospitalization and once you're in hospital really important it's really important you get the right type of intensive intensive and attentive personal care and you're also treated with things like immunosuppressive medication and that kind of thing that will help you to survive and reduce the number of people who once in hospital die and that's what didn't happen in the early part of the pandemic and what needs to change okay so summarizing how structural racism because a lot of these things are due to structural racism increases the chances of black people dying from COVID-19 so as you can see the first stage exposure to infection simply we know that what your work um, situation and we know black people are more likely to um, live and work in the city as I've said but also one of the important things is this idea of PPE Early in the pandemic, a lot of black people weren't given, particularly working in the NHS and, NHS and other places, they weren't given enough PPE. And so that would have increased their chances of being infected. And as I said before, there isn't a vaccine at the moment. And if one comes out, are you going to take it? We'll come back to that later on. From infection, we've mentioned what happens with a com com compromised immune system and comorbidities. Again, more black people have these conditions, so they're more likely to, um, to, 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 to become seriously ill. Antiviral medication, immunosuppressive medication can also help. But again, are you getting them in a timely manner? And finally, as I said, late diagnosis, um, negligent treatment. All of these things are going to be important to prevent death. And if there's this stage between hospitalization and death, that's key to why more black people are dying but you can prevent that if you have a virus that stops the infection uh, sorry vaccine that stops the infection in the first place okay so let's move on and think about medication particularly vaccine and how that could prevent serious illness so but as i said many black people are reluctant to take any covid19 a vaccine let's explore why that is why would black people be reluctant to take a vaccine that could protect them well we have a long history of medical mistreatment abuse negligences and discrimination and medical accidents all of these things combine to make people reluctant to be the first in line to take a vaccine and i want to explore some of these and perhaps remove some myths okay so let's have a look at medical abuse well we know there have been contradictory, what I call contradictory relationship between people of African descent and Western medicine. Let me explore that a bit more. So using <clears throat> Africa as a medical laboratory and not doing enough to tackle diseases which impact more on Africans. So, for example, there are lots of examples. People say how much truth there is, it, there is that, that whenever they want to try a new medication, they take it to an African country, perhaps because the regulations are less. These are myths. some of these are myths, but there is some truth. And also in terms of tackling the disease, which impact more on uh, people of African descent, like sickle cell. I mean, there should be much more research in, 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 into that kind of thing. So that's what we find that there's a contradictory relationship. On one hand, they want to test new medication in Africa. But on the other hand, where we know about diseases that they should be researching, there's a reluctance to do that. OK, also use of African slaves historically, excuse me, and their descendants in medical exper experimentation. And there's a famous um, American surgeon, Marion Sims, who used, to, who used slave women. He did experiments, gynecological experiments. And a lot of the things that we know about gynecology came from his experiments on black women um, without their permission. And also there's the Tuskegee study. This was a study apparently started in the 30s to look at the impact of syphilis in black men but in reality they did no such thing um, and there, there was very little informed consent and very little support and these men were on this um, study for you know 40 years it came to an end when it was discovered that basically this study had no benefit for them they weren't get any, getting any treatment for syphilis it was just um, uh, if you like a, a medical kind of scam totally morally wrong and finally the Henrietta Lacks story you may have heard of this, this woman she was in the 50s I think she died from cervical cancer and some doctors took or some scientists took some cells from her cervical cancer and grew them and they found they worked really well 
and the the healer cells they're called they're now used in research even i use them in research and they're, they're, they're used widely in research but there was no recognition from where they came from and more and the moral point about this also was that when the doctors discovered that these um these cells work so well for experimentation um, they went back to the family and would gather information um, secretly, not telling them why, so that they could relate the genetic um, markers within the HeLa cells to the family. And it was only recently that people started to highlight what was going on and suddenly there's been a big change and now the family um, has given permission for people to continue to use these cells. But these are just examples of abuses of people of African descent and that would if you like, be part of the um, story is why people are reluctant to get involved. OK, now I also want to talk about another aspect of this, and it's negligent and discriminatory treatment. It's very important. And this is quite a complex um, graph, but it's about the fact that <clears throat> um, there's lots of studies that show black people aren't always treated fairly in medical situations. This, this study is from America, but it's the same there are studies, similar studies in the UK, and basically it says perceived discrimination in medical settings and related factors by race and ethnicity. And we're just going to look at the, the columns, or sorry, the rows in red, because we don't, we don't have time to look at the whole thing. Where it says any type of discrimination in medical situation. Now, basically, they're comparing white people, white Americans to black Americans. And we can see 13% of, of white Americans will say they've experience some kind of discrimination in a medical setting, but over half, 56% of black Americans will say they um, um, had some kind of discrimination. Then we look at received poor service, whereas only 3% of white patients say that. Again, nearly 50%, half of black patients say they have received poorer service. Even when you go down to this one, and this one is important, the last one, doctor or nurse did not <clears throat> want to touch me. And this one is, if you think about how COVID is treated, COVID requires very close, attentive treatment. And if a doctor or nurse is unwilling to touch you, then, you know, you're not going to get the treatment you need. And 14% of black patients felt that was the case. So, so discrimination <clears throat> in terms of pain medication is also a, a historic one. But again, it goes to this idea that you don't necessarily get the type of treatment you need in hospital setting and that's going to be quite important so this is pain medication the graph looks complicated but all i want you to do is look at the the black bars as well as the dark gray bars the black bars represent white patients the dark the, the gray bars represent black patients and this is about pain medication opioids you go to the hospital with a migraine or back pain or a fracture and what you can see is that if you're white you're much more likely to be given the pain medication that you need and you are a white patient, whether it's for, as I said, migraine, back pain, or, or, or even a fracture. And that's because of um, biased perceptions about people and why they should, and why, how they should be treated. And if this happens for pain medication, for general hospital treatment, as I said, it can happen for um, COVID treatment. And finally, this really important one, it was uh, um, Keir Starmer, the leader of the Labour Party, mentioned this about two weeks ago in Parliament, where this study showed that Black women were five times more likely to die during pregnancy than their white counterparts. Five times more likely. Again, if you think about pregnancy, it's fine in a country like the UK. You know, things generally are, are okay. But if things go wrong, um, you need really very attentive and intensive care. And if you don't get that, there can be serious consequences. And this would explain why black women are more likely. To, 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 to die uh, in pregnancy than their white counterparts because they're not receiving the same attentive and intensive care. And if you look at this data, five times black women, if you look at black men, 4.7 times black men in terms of dying from COVID. So all of these things, there is a connection. Okay, so so how could va how could um, how could vaccinations protect black people from COVID-19? Um, to do that, to understand what's going on, you need to understand a little about <clears throat> the virus. So I'm going to take you through the science of virus and vaccinations, but at a level that I think everyone can understand it, both scientists and non-scientists. So let's start with the virus. A virus is the simplest parasite you can get. It's made up of genetic material. You've heard of DNA and RNA. These are messages that instruct a cell what to do. So these, uh, gen the genetic material in a virus, I'll show you a picture in a minute, is surrounded by a protective protein coat 
and sometimes an additional spiky uh, envelope. That spiky envelope is going to be important for COVID because that's what it used to attach and then enter the cell. So viruses, you have to remember, can only replicate when they're inside the host of the living cell. So that's why if you have a mask and the virus can't get into you, into the, into your body, then obviously they can't affect you. And they do this by, as I said, by latching onto and getting inside the cell. And let's look at the diagram I made myself. This is a simplified view of the coronavirus. What you can see on the outside of these spikes, and in these spikes, are, if you like, latch onto the cell and then enter. And once they're inside the cell, all the, 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 the protein coat, et cetera, and lipid envelope, they break down and it releases the DNA, so actually it's RNA, inside the, the, the host cell. And that RNA will then tell the host cell to start making more virus. And then the virus will multiply, 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 and cause you sickness. So that's what's happening. OK, so, so why do vaccines work? So let's learn a little about vaccines. Vaccination, vaccination mimics how our, our bodies respond when invaded by a pathogen like the coronavirus, but without the serious illness or the serious sickness. So if you could trick the body into thinking, right, you've got the coronavirus, it would respond in, in the same way. And that's what vaccination does. And as we'll see in a minute, it will have a memory of this. So every time you're invaded by, you're in, in, <clears throat> infected by the virus, the immune system will kick in. So signs of infection includes coughing, sneezing, fever, and inflammation. These are natural processes, and these are protective mechanisms. It's a war, it's telling you that, you know, you're, something's going on, you're being, you're being infected. Also, feeling sick is a combination of the virus multiplying inside your cells and our immune system fighting the virus. The fever, for example, that's actually your body trying to increase your body temperature because increased body temperature is disadvantageous, is disadvantageous to the viral growth and to bacterial growth. So that's why we get a, a fever when we're, we're, we're infected by pathogen because of the higher temperature, they don't like that. Okay, so, so what is the immune system doing? So we're gonna look at a little, look at a bit more detail of what the immune system is doing. Not too much detail, just a little. So bear with me. So, so to fight the infection, the body has two responses, an immediate general response, it's called an innate response, and that includes just the barriers. And then we have a delayed response taking several days, and this is more specific, and it's called the adaptive response. So you've got the innate and the adaptive systems, and they work together to protect us. Now, the adaptive response is what a vaccine switches on. So when, when you, you're vaccinated, what you're wanting your body to do is switch on the adaptive system. It is both specific and more importantly, is long lasting. And when you switch it on, and it's working, that's when they say you have immunity. So when you're infected again, um, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna have the effect, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be infected. So most of these responses, both the innate and the adaptive response, are mediated by special cells in our blood, the white cells, and bone marrow, including some called macrophages and neutrophils. So now you, when someone talks about macrophages and neutrophils, you will know these are cells of the immune system. And also B and T lymphocytes, they're very important, or B and T cells. Again, you might hear people talking about these. These are very important in giving us immunity. Okay, so so the cells of the immune system, what they do is they communicate by releasing chemicals. Uh, some of these chemicals are called cytokines. And these affect how not only these cells work together, but also how our cardiovascular system responds and fights the infection. So for example, the cytokines will make, for example, our blood vessels are more leaky, more permeable, and that will help the cells to get into the tissue and fight the infection. So there's lots of other things, but we don't have time to go into it. Now, the impact of a viral infection on morbidity, illness, and also on mortality, what happens? Let's have a look. So a high viral dose, so a dose of a virus, it's a bit like a dose of a drug, the more of a drug you take, the more effect it will have. So a high viral dose can overwhelm the body. So if you're next to someone who's sneezing out or whatever, re releasing lots of COVID-19 um, viruses, it's going to have an impact. So high viral dose can, dose can overwhelm the body before the immune system can respond. Remember this idea of the innate and then the adaptive system. So before they can kick in properly, you can be overwhelmed. And so you've got so much virus growing in your body, you can't do anything about it. So, so that's why masks and social distancing are so important. Okay. 
So <clears throat> if the immune system is slow to respond or compromise, and you see this in older people, and also you have comorbidity, so impacts on your cardiovascular system, which the immune system needs to work, you are more likely to be in trouble. So sometimes the immune system overreacts. That's what happens in older people. So initially it doesn't respond and then it overreacts. And that's where you may again have heard in the media something called a cytokine storm. Don't worry too much about it. All it's saying is that your, your immune system is overreacting. And that in itself can be very dangerous because it can change your blood pressure. It can cause excessive clotting, clotting. And that's what, what and some of these things that people die and also pneumonia and even death. So the, the overreaction of the immune system is one of the key ways in which um, the virus causes death in, in older people. So how do we get immunity? I mentioned it, okay? So when the innate, innate cells, the cells I've spoken to you about before, the ones that are there ready waiting and going and ready to go there, like on guard all the time, um, <clears throat> when our immune, Im, immune no, I'm sorry, when our innate cells consume the virus, what they do is they literally, they engulf the virus as soon as they see it. They also learn what the virus is made of what's unique about it. So they, they, they consume the virus and if you like, the virus is suddenly now, they break it down and they look at it and they say, all right, the virus is made of X, Y, Z. So they know what the virus is made of. And then this information they share with cells of the adaptive system. So what you have is that it's like a relay. The immune, the innate system passes the information on to the adaptive system. And what the adaptive cells then they display what bits of the virus called antigen, so that bits of the virus on their surfaces. So now the innate cells pass the information into the, the uh, adaptive cells. They then have this displayed on their bodies. And so what this does is the adaptive cells, for example, B cells, use the information to make antibodies because the antibodies need to bind to the antigen. So they need to know what the antigen looks like. So the, the, the cells will tell each other the antigen that we, the antibody needs to look like this antigen. So that's what's happening. So the adaptive cells use the information to make antibodies, lots of antibodies, which are special molecules which can bind these antigens. One of the antibodies bind the antigens, the viral antigens now, because um, that will, if you like, help to neutralize the virus. Because as soon as the body sees a virus, it says, oh, I know that, I recognize that put some antibodies on it and that will knock it out. Okay, so antibodies either directly neutralize the virus, they also do something else. They make it easier for the immune system, the T cells, remember I talk about B and T cells, the B cells make the antibodies, the T cells respond to kill in cells infected with the virus. Because remember I said the virus latches onto a cell, gets inside and starts to multiply. So if the body can identify which cells are making lots of virus and destroy them, then you don't get this multiplication. So that's what the immune system is doing as it goes along. So interestingly, once you've, you know, you've overpowered the virus, you get some of these B and T cells will live a long time. So they remain in your blood, they don't die, or your bone marrow, and they stay there. And then if you, and then you have a memory of the viral antigen, so, um, immunity means that if you are ever infected again, the same virus, uh, <clears throat> by the same or a similar virus, the response is much quicker and less damaging. That's why you know you 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 you, <clears throat> you immunize young children, and it keep uh, for a lot of um, immunizations, it will last a long time. One of the problems with COVID at the moment is that they're thinking that that might not always happen, but that's for another discussion. But generally, when you have immunity, it's for a long time or lifetime. Every time you're in you're infected by the same or similar viruses, you, your body will respond. So it's a good thing. Okay, so, so how can we stimulate immunity without infection? Remember I said the normal way is you're infected and then you get immunity, but the, the trouble with infection is that infection can kill you, okay? And I don't know if you've heard people talking about this idea of herd immunity. So natural herd immunity doesn't really exist because a lot of people would die um, um, in trying to achieve that. Whereas if you can get herd immunity by using a vaccine, that's much better. So how can you get, how can you stimulate immunity <clears throat> without infection? And the answer is vaccination. So for COVID-19, over a hundred vaccines are being developed as we speak, because everyone wants to be the first to develop a new um, COVID-19 vaccine. It's like, a, it's national pride. So the Americans are doing it, the Russians are doing it, the Chinese are doing it, the Japanese, and here in the UK, we're doing it as well. And so they, these competitions, over a hundred, okay? Now, 
the first time, <clears throat> the first time, so this is the first time I'd say so much resources have been invested in a disease that is supposed to primarily affect people of African and South Asian descent. Remember, the data suggested that black and Asian people are more likely to die from the virus, and all this resources is going into developing a vaccine. So that tells you that it's not really about being black or Asian, it's about everyone, and that's why everyone is involved in developing the vaccine. And that's why one another reason that one could argue that one might trust it. So let's give you an example, um, some <clears throat> idea of how you actually make a virus. So techniques used to develop vaccines for COVID-19. Now, they're based on five techniques, so quite a bit because I said a hundred different vaccines have been developed. They're all, there are five different ways people are doing it. And they're all, some are well established. So we've had vaccines for many years, as we'll see over a hundred years, and there are some which are new. Okay, so a number of different techniques. And the target is always the spike protein. Remember that diagram I showed with the spike protein at the top? That's being decided by almost everyone. That's what you need to have immunity against. So every time your body sees the spike protein, it knows throughout, we need to attack this with antibodies, we need to attack this with T cells and get rid of it. Okay, so let's have a look at the different types. We've got whole vaccine, and I'll explain what these are. Whole vaccine, so whole virus vaccine, viral vector vaccines, these are very complex terms and I'll explain in a minute, genetic vaccines, viral protein vaccines, and viral particle vaccines. So these are the five main techniques and I'll use a diagram to illustrate what I want. So in the center, as you can see, if you like, is a model of what might be the coronavirus. And what you can see on the outside are these spike, the spike protein, and on the, surrounded by the, 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 the envelope, and inside the squiggly thing, that's the genetic material, the material that says, basically um, tells the, the, the cells, once it in, it's inside the cell, how to make a new vaccine, um, sorry, a new virus particle. So here we are, that's what we're gonna start. And we're gonna use this to illustrate how the vaccines work. So the first type of vaccine is this, it's called an ina <clears throat> inactivated virus. So what you do is you basically take the virus, either you heat treat it, but more recently or more effectively, you treat it with certain chemicals and the chemicals will kill the virus so it can't multiply, but as you can see, the spike proteins are still there. So the immune system of the host will be able to see it. Okay, so that's one way, inactivated virus. So as we'll see when we look at safety and efficacy, that could be quite important. Then we have an attenuated virus. Again, what we do is you start off with the pathogenic virus, the virus that causes disease. You then treat it in the laboratory to mutate it and it changes. And then you can say, if you look at this one, it's got lots of spike proteins, whereas this one has much less. And if it has less spike proteins, it's gonna be less pathogenic. And again, you can give that to a patient. And again, that will switch on the immune system, but you won't get the same infection. Then we have viral vector vaccines. These are very common. What you do is you take the genetic material from the pathogenic bacteria that says make a spike protein. You put it into a virus that you know um, is safe and you have those. So you, the, virus, the virus becomes a vector for the genes. And then once it's inside, again, it will, it will be released and it will make spike proteins. And so you get the vaccine that way. More recent one includes DNA vaccines. So what they do again, they take the DNA material from the virus and they put it into a special carrier. And again, they inject it into the host and that will enable the host to make viral particles, the spike protein, and then switch on the immune system. Or you can actually make, um, collect the viral particles and create an artificial type um, virus or you can just inject the spike protein. So all of these are ways of fooling the body, the immune system, that you're being invaded, you're being infected by a virus, and it will then start to make antibodies and have an immune response against the, the, the virus, the pathogenic virus, but without actually using the virus, the live, fully pathogenic virus itself. Okay, so, so let's so I said there are these five techniques. Let's briefly look at the efficacy and safety. Efficacy means how good is it? Will it make lots of antibodies um, for you? And also how safe is it? Is it likely to cause a problem? Now, as we can say, the inactivated virus, you can see uh, it's got good safety, but because the virus is inactivated, it's not very efficacious. It doesn't work that well. And also, for example, whereas the, the, the viral vector virus has fair 
is good, good safety and also good efficacy. So that would suggest it's really good. And if you look on this side, current examples of viruses or vaccines that use this technique, um, there's quite a few. But more importantly, the government um, is back in the Oxford University virus and it works by this technique. Similarly, there's another virus that the government is back in, the Imperial College one. And this one works on the genetic vaccine principle. It has both good safety and good efficacy. The problem with this technique, though, it's really, really new. No one has ever done this. Other types of um, viruses, as you can see, for example, the MMR virus, which has been around for a long time, and you can see that's the attenuated virus. So what they do, they give you a weakened live virus um, and it, it, will give you immuno, it will give you immunity without actually giving you measles, mumps or rubella. So this is just an example of how vaccination works. This graph is not very clear, but all it wants, all I wanted to use to show you that normally when you're developing a new vaccine, it can take a long time, starting with the research in the university laboratories and companies that can take up to 10 years. And then you can have perhaps another five years of um, clinical trials as testing uh, humans and that kind of thing. What's happened is that they've used the information that they've had previously to speed up the process. So that's why um, some people are arguing that it's, take, it's, 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 it's far too quick. And there's no doubt we've, we've speeded up the process, but they've been able to do that because we have so much knowledge from past vaccine developments that we can use to our advantage. And um, so um, that's what they're doing. They've expedited the process, but hopefully in a safe way, as we'll see. So, so what happens after vaccination? So we've mentioned um, the process, how you develop a vaccine. What's after vaccination? Generally, you'll get mild symptoms. And that's because you and the symptoms is going to get normally redness and swelling at the site of the injection, if it is injected, because not all vaccines are injected. You may get some systemic responses such as fever, headache, of feeling tired, general sickness. And again, this is your body, your immune system responding. And remember, I said that's normally a good thing, provided it's not too dramatic. And this will normally go with a vaccine after a few days to a week or so. It should go away and then you're fine. In some rare cases, and I have to be honest, you might get an allergic response to the vaccine, perhaps an, anal an, al an, al an al anaphylactic shock. OK, but these are rare occasions and that could happen with any kind of medications, vaccine or not. So um, you can't simply just blame the vaccine. So, so why do, I'm coming to the end now, so why do vaccines make us nervous? What's going on? What, why do vaccines make us nervous? Particularly us as black people. I know I've seen a lot of stuff on the internet, on WhatsApp about stories about vaccines. So what is it that makes us nervous? First of all, and that's general, not just black people, I suppose, the administration of the vaccine. When you administer a vaccine, it's an injection and lots of people just don't like to be injected. So that could be the reason. But remember, other vaccines are given either orally, so you take them as a pill or even as a sweet or, um, for example, the flu vaccine, I think, is a nasal spray. So there are other reasons. The history of vaccine may have something to do. So let's have a brief look at the uh, of the history of vaccine. Obviously, vaccines were, well, not obviously, vaccines were first, if you like, modern vaccines were created or invented um, by someone called Edward Jenner, and he basically used a smallpox, he developed a smallpox vaccine. He noticed that milkmaids um, were less likely to get smallpox, and, that, and he thought that it could, could it be to do with the fact that they're, she's, they've been exposed to the cowpox, which is a similar kind, kind of virus, and so they got immunity. And he basically, unethically, he basically um, in, in inoculated a small boy um, um, with, with, a, with, with a smallpox vaccine, having exposed him to the cowpox and found that it worked. So that's the start of the vaccine. I, I've sort of summarised that story, but generally that's what's happening. So he observed that prior exposure to a pathogen um, could give you protection uh, from a similar pathogen. So that was his major discovery. But I think, um, if my history reminds me, I think even the Chinese had discovered this long, long before that, as you do. Okay, so, so so once you started off with the first vaccines, between 1914 and 1948, there were lots of other vaccines, things like vaccines for whooping cough, diphtheria and tetanus. They were all, all sort of developed around that time. And then even a triple vaccine. So people discovered that rather than giving people three separate injections at different times, you can combine these vaccines, triple vaccines, and give them together. Okay. In then, in the early 1950s, the big one because was polio, vaccine against polio, because polio was such a big 
um, killer or maiming of people. So you, you really wanted a vaccine against COVID. And, and they found one, but almost immediately, unfortunately, because of quality control issues, some of the vaccines were contaminated with the, the live polio vaccine. So instead in sort of inoculating with a, um, a weakened vaccine, um, they were, in, if you like, inoculating people. So it's a directly giving people vaccine. And so you've got a uh, um, directly giving people the virus. So you actually got um, um, the, 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 va the virus from the vaccination, which was a terrible thing. That's because they didn't do quality control well. So then there was another um, contamination, this time with a simian virus. So what you were seeing early on, especially in, in the last century, um, vaccines being produced that were, in, were contaminating and rather than protect people, they were um, causing greater problems. But that was a long time ago. OK, there's also an issue around politics and vaccines. So, for example, in 1976, scientists predicted a pandemic, a flu pandemic um, in the United States. And they persuaded or President Ford was persuaded to make immunization um, um, compulsory. If you think in America there was t uh, for, for the, the, the flu in 1918, the flu pandemic in 1918, lots of people died and they were fearful of that so they decided that right the way to stop this is to develop and give people a, f a, um, a, a, a vaccine against the flu unfortunately or fortunately i should say yes 40 40 million people were uh, vaccinated but fortunately there was no flu pandemic but later there was speculation linking vaccination to a small number of a neurological disorder called Guillain-Barre syndrome which can develop after infection or really after vaccination with a live virus. It's very, very rare, but it can happen. And um, again, it's all it's partly about quality control. Uh, and, and there was no 100% link, um, but the, just the speculation was enough to damage the reputation of vaccines. OK, so let's look at modern, also modern trials, modern vaccine trials in Africa. Another reason why we might be suspicious about vaccines. So what we know is there's pre presently a trial on the way uh, in Malawi, Ghana and Kenya, and, um, and it's been slated because uh, uh, it, 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 it has about 700,000 children. Uh, for an experimental vaccine, and this and the problem is, as some argue in the Medi British the British Medical Journal, about the lack of information to the patients, so they don't have informed consent. They've just effectively been sort of like cajoled. It's been suggested into taking this vaccine, which may be really good, and it's going to be evaluated evaluated over the next two years in terms of has it worked or not. But there's a suggestion that a lot of the children who have been vaccinated, their parents didn't really have that in informed consent. So today, some governments also have been accused of covering up problems with the modern polio vaccine. And if you look, as we'll see in a minute, there's very few countries where polio is still a problem because in those areas, people are reluctant to take the, the polio vaccine. And here, here's the graph. So if you like, it says progress of polio elimination 1988 to 2004, you can see countries um, never um, never eliminated. And by 2014, you can see almost everywhere in the world, except for these two countries, I can't even see where they are. Let's just say one's near India and one's near Nigeria, somewhere around the part of the world. But the point is, these two countries, they still have polio. But I think there's a war going on in this country while that occurred. Um, either Sierra Leone or Sierra Leone or some country. I can't remember. I don't want to speculate. But anyway, so you can see, if you go from 1988 to 2014, you can see vaccines worked, except the only way it didn't work and where you didn't eliminate was in these two countries for political reasons, I think, you know, around Afghanistan and Pakistan, where there was a war and that kind of thing. OK, so the other thing to look at is, this is global vaccination coverage. And you can see all these diseases have been, you know, covered by so one-year-olds who have been vaccinated, some of them 88%. So a lot of vaccination is going on. So millions and millions of people are being vaccinated all the time. And there are very few problems with vaccination. So just to remind you, to survive in hospital, COVID-19 patients <clears throat> require very timely and intensive personalized care. If you don't get that, it's not going to happen. We know that when you look at people like Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, they had this intensive personalized care. 
if you think you can guarantee that you will get that intensive and personal kids like the prime minister and the president, then perhaps you don't need to think about a vaccine. But there are many scientific studies showing that the quality of that and diagnosis and treatment of black patients is less than that provided by their white counterparts and definitely less than what something like someone like a president or a prime minister would receive. So you need to take that into consideration. So this could have a direct effect on medical outcomes of black patients infected with COVID. So if you, you know, black patients are generally not being treated as well as they could have been, especially at the start of the pandemic. I don't know what the situation is now, but I know before we highlighted these issues of more black people dying, there was definitely a problem. Okay, so in conclusion and in finishing off, what can I say? Every year, millions are vaccinated with few proven adverse effects from these vaccinations. OK, black people are more likely to die from a COVID-19 infection as a result of a combination of increased exposure, as we've said before, poor diagnosis and treatment and hospital care.